you guys to listen while we're taking the offering this morning. Uh, I want to speak to you about something that's going to happen this next week. Um, we're going to be in our final message of this particular series, and next week I'm going to be preaching a message entitled, uh, No Limits to the Way God Heals. And the Holy Spirit has begun to speak to me and my team and also uh, the prayer team in this, that next week, uh, after we get done with the message, we want to call forth all of the sick and those individuals that need healing in their body. In fact, we are going to do service a little bit differently. We're going to do a little bit of worship up front, get to the message, and then save a lot of time at the end so that we can lay hands on the sick and believe for healing. How many of you believe that God still heals people today and he's more than able? And so I want to say not only to you, but those that are watching online, maybe you're sick and you haven't been able to come. And I want to encourage you, be here this next week. We are going to take the time this next week specifically to pray for the sick in our service. And I'm going to ask you all to do me a favor. I've already asked my pastoral staff and the prayer teams to be in prayer all week long so that when we walk into this building, we're going to walk into this place with a level of faith that is ready for God to move. And I'm asking all of you to join with me all week long in prayer. And let's believe God for some amazing things to happen in our service when it comes to healing. And I will let you know, there will only be one individual on display this next week, and his name is Jesus, and he is the only one that can heal, but I'm telling you, when he is present and faith arises, God can do amazing things among us. So this next week, we're going to be believing God for amazing things for people. I want to encourage you to come and be ready for all that God has in store for us. Well, we are at... Uh, our next message in this um, No Limits series. And the title of the message today is No Limits to God-Sized Dreams. So I want you to write this in your notes this morning, if you would. One of the saddest places a believer will ever arrive is doing good things rather than God things. It's easy to arrive in this place and not even know you're there. Put this down as well. Most believers over time forfeit God-sized dreams for good things. How many of you know there's a huge difference between God things and good things? We can do lots of good things for God. We can fill our time with those good things. And at the end of the day, those good things actually make us feel good. But the moment we substitute good things for God things is the moment dreams begin to die. Now, why is this so dangerous? Because good things can never be a substitute for God-sized dreams. Let me define what I mean by good things. Good things are things that don't stretch us. They don't require faith. They are the things that we can do with no real Holy Spirit empowerment. How many of you know in the Christian community, we can get in routines of doing a lot of good things, but they don't necessarily stretch us or require faith to intervene to see God move in amazing ways. And so this morning, I want us to really contemplate this idea of good things. There's a lot of churches doing a lot of good things for the kingdom. But I want you to know there are a lot of those things that they are doing that don't require Holy Spirit empowerment. They're just good things. And I don't want to be about doing just good things. I want to be involved in God-sized dreams for the kingdom. You see, most of the time, a life filled with good things is a life of comfort. As believers, this is where a lot of us feel most secure. 
In fact, God warned against the dangers of people simply settling into the good life. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. It says this, starting at verse 11. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey His commands, regulations, and decrees that I am giving you today. When you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget that he led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions where it was so hot and dry. He gave you water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble and test you for your own good. He did this so that you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you the power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. Notice God's warning. He knew his kids would be prone to settling into the good life, into the comfortable life, into the secure life. But God reminded them when they lived a life that was filled in the unknown, when they had to rely on God for the manna and the water and his leadership, and, and they had to re- he required faith and dependence upon him. He said, this was for your own good. Be careful when you're in the good place and you're blessed that you don't forget to live a life of faith and dependence upon me. Because when you have faith and dependence upon him, how many of you know that's when you see the power of God show up in your life? Amen. You see, the difference between the good life and the God life with God-sized dreams is huge. Let me define God-sized dreams. This is the kind of life that is uncomfortable and requires faith and dependence upon God or you will fail. I'm talking about the kinds of dreams that require faith and dependence upon Him. Otherwise, this thing isn't going to happen. That's what a God-sized dream really is. But how many of you know the reward of seeing God-sized dreams come to pass in your life is like nothing you will ever experience? How many of you have ever experienced a God-sized dream coming to pass for you, your family, your church, your community? It's amazing. Today we're going to look at a young man with God-sized dreams. His name is Joseph. Many of us are familiar with the life of Joseph. I want you to turn with me to, uh, if you would, Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37. When you read the story of Joseph, especially in chapter 37, you're going to recognize a few things. The first thing that's going to jump out at you is this guy comes from a very dysfunctional family. Let me ask this morning, how many of... How many of us this morning come from some dysfunctional family situations? Raise your hand. Well, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you want to, (laughs) go for it. I'm just here to encourage you that we're in good company. We're not excluded because of our family heritage. Man, this stuff that was going on in Joseph's life, there was favoritism, jealousy, backbiting, Hate, hate, hatred, and, and many other things that the, were the backdrop of this story. And so we arrive at Genesis 37 with, with Joseph living in this dysfunctional family. And then it simply says in verse 5, Joseph had a dream. Let's stop right there. We know this was a God-sized dream. This dream would require faith, trust, and God's divine intervention. Now, before we move forward, let me ask you, when was the last time you had this kind of dream? 
When was the last time that you had the kind of dream that stretched you, the kind of dream that required faith of you? You see, this question can reveal whether you've settled into the good life or you're still fighting for the God life. And we're going to find, contrary to popular Western Christianity, uh, things were about to get rough for Joseph. You know, there's this thing in Western uh, um, uh, Christianity that somehow we have this idea that once God downloads a dream or a vision to us and we're going all in for him, we kind of get this idea that everything is just going to work itself out and we're going to see all these blessings just start flowing our way. I have news for you. It doesn't work that way. In fact, when we look at Joseph's life, from the moment God downloaded this God-sized dream, man, everything got chaotic. Everything spun out of control. Really, God was in control, but Joseph's life seemed out of control. And we're going to glean some things from his life this morning. Let's look at verse 5 and read through verse 11. Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were building sheaves of, binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf arose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. At this time, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told this dream to his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept this matter in mind. Now, I don't have time to go into everything about this story. I'm going to give you just some key scriptures. But from the time this dream happened, Joseph brothers head off with the family flocks to a distant land quite a ways away. And Joseph's dad, Israel, told Joseph to go check on his brothers and come back and bring a report as to how they're doing. So Joseph finally finds his brothers in Dothan. And while Joseph is still a long way off, his brothers see him coming. And let's listen to what they said about him. Look at verse 18. But when they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of those cisterns and say a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. One of the brothers keeps his cool and says, no, we don't want his blood on our hands. Let's not kill him. Let's do something else. And so they strip him of his robe. And in verse 24, it says, they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty and there was no water in it. They were going to leave him there when they were sitting around talking. All of a sudden, a Midianite caravan of merchants was traveling by, and this became the perfect solution to their situation. They could sell their brother into slavery and never hear from him again. Look at verse 28. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver. Do you know how much 20 shekels of silver is today? They sold him for $113.95 to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. They went back home and they told their father that his youngest son was killed by a ferocious animal. How cruel is that to do to your parents? You read the story, dad and mom were just destroyed by this event, but the brothers were so full of hatred, they never let him in on the secret. They go back home and they tell their father these things. So I want to set this sermon with the backdrop of two themes, those who have God-sized dreams and those who don't. I want you to notice this, write it in, and here's what you need to be aware of. Not everyone will be excited to hear about the dream God has given you.
Not everyone's going to get excited about that dream. In fact, people who have no dreams of their own often criticize the dreams of others. So God comes and he fills your heart with something. The something he has given to you, you don't even fully understand. But in your enthusiasm, you begin to share your God-sized dream with others. And you weren't prepared for the reaction from those around you. Joseph, in his excitement, shares his dreams with those who are closest to him. His family, but his brothers had no dreams of their own. Write this down if you would. Beware of sharing your God-sized dreams with people who quit dreaming. Look at Joseph's brother's response. When Joseph arrived in Dothan looking for his brothers, they see him coming, and I want to read it again. This is the premise for the message. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of those cisterns and say a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. There are five things every dreamer needs to be prepared for. If you want to be a dreamer for the kingdom and you're believing God for God-sized things in your life, five things that you need to be prepared for when it comes to following those God-sized dreams. First, write it down. You will be misunderstood. Look at Joseph's brother's response. Here comes that dreamer, they said in verse 19. Now, this was a sarcastic phrase, not intended to be flattering. In fact, the actual construction of the Hebrew phase is the master of dreams. Commentators say that phrasing means this. It could have meant one of two things. That Joseph wasn't a master of interpreting dreams, but simply dreaming them. He was the contriver of them and only pretended to have them when he really had none. So they were accusing him of just making this stuff up. Or secondly, it could have meant... He had frequently dreamed and would always tell them, and they were just sick of hearing about his dreams. Didn't want to hear it anymore. Joseph's dreams were misunderstood by his brothers. When you allow yourself to dream God-sized dreams, be ready to be misunderstood. Here's the biggest challenge of all. You may not fully understand the dream yourself. Has God ever given you something you don't fully understand it or how it's going to come about? <clears throat> and then you begin to share it with others and they're just kind of looking at you like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> Are there any of you that God has called you to do things and you're, you're misunderstood right now by those that are around you? Here's what I want to say. Welcome to the club. Secondly, write it down. You'll be talked about. You'll be, ta you'll, you'll, you'll be talked about. You'll be talked about. Genesis 39, 19, here comes that dreamer. They said to each other, I imagine. Can you imagine? What were his brothers saying about him when he wasn't there? As much as they hated him and couldn't stand him, when they sat around that fire in Dothan watching those, those flocks at night, what were they saying about their brother? How were they ridiculing him? How were they tearing him down? You see, God oftentimes puts us in a precarious position. He will give us God-sized dreams we don't always understand, and we will follow in faith even if others don't support us. The Apostle Paul said it this way, Galatians 1.10, Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. It's not going to be easy to follow a God-sized dream. Thirdly, put this down, you'll be, you will be discouraged from dreaming. You will be discouraged from dreaming. I call these people dream killers. Look at Genesis 37, verse 20. Come now, let us kill him. You see, if they kill Joseph, what happens? They kill his dreams with him. 
People who don't have God-sized dreams can discourage you from having your dreams of your own. And I say, be careful who you share them with. There will be those that will come against you, have things to say about you. There will be those that will discourage you. When's that ever going to happen? How long is it going to take? How's it going to come about? Why are you giving so much money anyway? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Can you see how slowly that begins to kill the dream that is in Side. Be careful who you share your God-sized dream with. Number four, you will be attacked. You will be attacked. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into the cistern and say a ferocious animal devoured him. Two metaphors I want to share with you here. Number one, you can be attacked by people, sometimes those closest to you. You'll be attacked by people when you start to move in the direction of God-sized dreams. But secondly, they talked about a ferocious animal. I believe there's types and shadows in the Bible. The Bible talks about in the New Testament, the devil is like a roaring what? Lion seeking whom he may devour. How many of you know also with God-sized dreams, the enemy is going to come and attack you as well. You will be in spiritual warfare fighting for those dreams to come about. Two sources of the attack. Lastly, under this point, you will be dismissed. Look at Genesis 37, verse 20. They said it in a dismissive way. Then we will see what comes of his dreams. We'll see what happens after this happens. We'll see what comes of his dreams. Just remember, the enemy will use any combination of these things to discourage you and try to keep you from seeing God-sized dreams come true. The first five things are the things that will come against you. The next things are the things that are going to happen to you. Three things I want to mention. First, write it in. God-sized dreams will always stretch you. People often ask me, how do I know if it's the Lord? And I want to say there are many ways to test if it's of the Lord, and I don't have time to cover them all this morning, but the first initial indicator that it's of the Lord is when God drops something into your heart and it initially scares you. Yeah. You're in your prayer time and all of a sudden God downloads something to you through the word or through prayer and you're like, what? Wait a minute, wait, Lord, wait a minute now. You got the right person here, Lord? Are you sure? How many of you have ever been there? You've been in prayer and God gives you something and you're like, whoa, wait a minute. You've got the wrong person. That's the wrong amount. There is no way. I mean, if that's your initial reaction to what's coming to you in prayer, that's from the Lord. There have been many things over the years that God has dropped into my spirit and I've absolutely been scared to death, not in a bad way, in a good way. That's when I know it's not from me because the dreams I would dream, I would be able to accomplish. <laughs> God-sized dreams are always impossible unless God shows up. Number two, or write it down. God-sized dreams will move you out of your comfort zone. Notice with Joseph, after he shares his dream, his life was about to change forever. Everything that was familiar was now about to change. One minute, he's with his family. He's in a familiar setting. He's in his hometown where he grew up. And the next minute, he is sold into slavery and on his way to what seems like an uncertain future. Here's what you must recognize. The opposition that may come your way is a tool God can use to move you towards the fulfillment of his promise. I want some of you to get that. The opposition that may come your way, God can use to move you towards the fulfillment of his promise. He's moving you out of your comfort zone. 
When I have moved out of my comfort zone, it creates total dependence upon him. There's a huge danger that we need to be aware of. I want you to write this in your notes if you would. When opposition comes, the danger is you begin to focus on the people or circumstances that oppose, circumstances that oppose you rather than the promises God has given you. What if God is using opposition to align you with his promise? Instead of getting upset by those who oppose you or circumstances around you, why don't you start praising God for what is about to unfold? How many times do we get fixed on the instrument that God is using rather than the promise he's given us? We get fixed on people and circumstances and I can't believe how they're acting and what they're doing and this and that. Have you ever thought that maybe in response to the dream that God has given you, those responses are pushing you in a direction so that this thing can unfold? This is exactly what happened with Joseph. He recognized this when his dream was fulfilled. Opposition. How many of you know Joseph faced some opposition? Have you ever read the story all the way through? Lord Jesus. I mean, it's unbelievable. You know how long it took for the promise to be fulfilled? You know how long it took for the time he dreamed the dream to when he was sold in slavery, falsely accused, put in prison, beat down? You know how long it was? How long went by? 22 years. 22 years. Now the dream finally comes into focus. Guess who's before him bowing down? And he reveals who he is. How many of you know that was a rude awakening for his brothers? 22 years later, there they are. But listen to Joseph's response in Genesis chapter 50, verse 18 through 20. Listen to what it says. Now he's the ruler of Egypt. They're bowed before him. And he says to them, but Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Did you see Joseph's perspective? So many people would never have this perspective. For 22 years, they would have been thinking about, how can I get even with my brothers who betrayed me? Oh, when they finally come into my presence, I'm going to set this record straight. They robbed me of my childhood. They robbed me of my family. They robbed me of my parents. When they finally get in front of me, I'm going to do something about it. Joseph didn't have that attitude at all. He said, my eyes have always been on Jesus. And guys, I know, I know you meant to harm me, but my God is bigger than even what you've done. And he used this to put me here so I could be a blessing to other people. What a perspective. It's absolutely amazing. Write this in if you would. What you tried to do to me is not bigger than what God has in store for me. I'm not mad at you. It had to happen. Otherwise, I would have never moved out of my comfort zone. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't angry. He wasn't vengeful. He was grateful for the good works that God was accomplishing. How many of you have ever heard the story, maybe in a message or somewhere else, about baby eagles and what mama does to get the baby eagles out of the nest? And some of you, like myself, have heard stories where the mama comes and at some point pushes them out of the nest so they can fly. I began to do a little research on this subject and I found out that the whole idea of the mother eagle pushing the babies out of the nest is a myth. It's not true. Eagles of all birds build the biggest and most comfortable nest for their young. In the beginning, these young chicks have it made. They're well fed, they're well protected, they're comfortable, but when the adult eagle, when mama deems it's time for them to fly, it's about to get uncomfortable. 
The mama eagle knows exactly when it's time for them to go. And do you know what she does to make this happen? She quits feeding them. Man, I could do a whole nother message for parents on this one. She's pretty smart, isn't she? She quits feeding them. What does that do? See, they're in that nice, beautiful, comfortable nest, getting fattened up. Mama's doing all the work, just hanging out. And when they finally come to the right time, Mama says, enough. You've been comforted enough. You've been coddled enough. It's time for you to get your wings. And so she quits feeding them. And when she quits feeding them, a hunger starts to be created. And it gets so intense that it starts to move them to the edge of that nest. You know what else she does to encourage them a little bit? I love these mama eagles. You know what she does as they're starting to get real hungry? She will fly in with food in her mouth outside of the nest. Come on out here. And she will fly, and eventually it'll get so uncomfortable they'll take the leap. Now stay with me for a moment. Think about our own lives. When we're comfortable, we're in a comfortable place, and spiritually speaking, our belly is full. When we have all we need and things are comfortable and we're in a routine, there's no need to go any further. L listen, when you get too comfortable and stay too long. It's easy to stop dreaming when your belly is full, when, 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 you, when you don't feel like you need to fly. But listen to me this morning. God comes along and he wants to give you God-sized prayer, uh, God-sized visions and dreams. And how many of you know, most of those aren't answered when you're in the comfortable nest. Most of those are answered outside of that nest. Some of you have been praying and, and, and you're following that, that dream and you're like, God, God, where are you? I don't sense you. And here's the thought that came to me with this illustration. He's saying, listen, no, I, it's not that I don't love you. I do love you, but I'm not going to feed you right there anymore. You're not going to get it the way you've always got it. You've got to come to me. I'm over here. Come on out of that area and come to me. I'm going to teach you something new. I'm going to take you deeper. What we did before isn't going to work any longer. It's not that he's cruel. He loves you and he wants to launch you. Yes. Amen. to new heights and new places and new experiences. God is moving you beyond your comfort zone towards your destiny. As I wrap this up, write this in and we'll close this out. God-sized dreams require faith. If what you're doing for the kingdom requires no faith, it's not God-sized. Yes, we can do a lot of good things in the church that don't, that don't require faith. They're routines, and, and God accomplishes great things. But that isn't where we're supposed to stay. He wants to stretch us and launch us. Ask yourself, when is the last time it required faith of me to do what I'm about to do for the kingdom? And if it's been a long time, you've been sitting in your nest way too long. You know what we're looking for at New Life? some dreamers. I'm looking for a church filled with dreamers. If this church is filled with people who have God-sized vision, we would not be able to contain all that God has in store for us. We couldn't do it. It's, it's, it's bigger than all of us. And so this morning, I want to remind you as we close out today, if you are after a God-sized dream, you'll be misunderstood, talked about, discouraged from dreaming, attacked, and dismissed. God-sized dreams will stretch you, move you out of your comfort zone, and require faith. And if that's you today, if you're saying, Pastor, I am all in, I'm ready, I also want to say this. For those of you that are here today that have quit dreaming, you've quit dreaming, there is a danger for you. People who quit dreaming often criticize the dreams of others. And I just want to challenge you today. If you've quit dreaming to do greater things for the kingdom, here's what I want to tell you. At least stop criticizing those that want to go for it for the kingdom. 
Don't fall in the camp of Joseph's brothers. If you don't want to do it for yourself, at least pray that God will accomplish it through others. Don't fall into that camp of criticizers. Not a good place to be. So if you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, I want some God-sized dreams in my life that are way bigger than me, that scare me, but I am ready to go for it. If that's you, as we begin to sing, you just stand up to your feet wherever you are, and we're just going to...